now with the presentation of Professor Vladimir Dubrovsky. Dubrovsky is a mathematician who very early in his career started uh, working on education of uh, very gifted young students from the, Como, uh, the world famous Komogorov School for Young Talents. The school uh, is part, belongs to State University of Moscow. It was created by the famous mathematician Andrei Komogorov in the early 60s. It's a tremendous success of, as a place to actually offer a very high level of education for very talented people. And it's a great pleasure for us to hear from um, Dubrovsky about this uh, success, story of successes belonging to the school. Uh, Komogorov was uh, a brilliant mathematician, as I said before, and he started his uh, work on education when he was around six years old with the foundation of the school. Uh, Dubrovsky uh, has done uh, a lot of work uh, concerning education of young uh, students. He, he belongs also to the organizing committee of international challenge in mathematical modeling. He has numerous uh, prizes from the Department of Education in Moscow, from the University of Moscow, and he has numerous contacts with other universities abroad, uh, namely Finland, uh, from the US, also from uh, South Korea, and we are very fortunate to hear from him, and we look also forward to, to have many words of advice from him in case we want to do a similar project in Brazil, which I think would be very important for Brazil. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Vladimir, and please, Vladimir, we all look forward to your talk. Please. Thank you. So I will try to uh, welcome everybody in Portuguese. Boa tarde. <laughs> Boa tarde. Uh, and uh, let me start. So um, the school, the Kolmogorov School, its full name now is Advanced Education and Science Center of Moscow State University, as you see. And uh, I will start with a, a little story. Mm, when I looked at the site of IAP, I suddenly saw a familiar face. And this is the face of my former student. He studied in our school for two years. He was actually in my class. And even he sat at the same desk with my son, who also was a, a student of this school at that time. Um, and so he gave some talk here in this institute in May, as you see. And uh, his story, I mean, his life story, if I may say so, is both typical and not very typical for uh, our students. So I will say a few words about him. Um, he was, uh, he comes from an Armenian family and uh, in early, in the, at the end of 1980s and early 1990s, um, there were quite dramatic events in Azerbaijan uh, where many Armenians lived and his family in particular. And uh, so after these events, many Armenians had to leave Azerbaijan. Many of them came to Russia. And his family also came to Russia and they settled in a very small town, which is famous for their uh, shoals, you know. It's, uh, and uh, so his family settled there and uh, it is like 50 kilometers from Moscow. Um, 550. And uh, so he stayed there and then he entered our school. And so he spent two years in the school, graduated in 2000 or something about, maybe 2001, don't remember, and maybe 2001 actually. And then he went to one of the best Russian universities in 
it is actually it is outside Moscow, but it is called Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. It's very famous. I think that Alvar knows uh, must know about this institute. And um, after four years in this university, having received his bachelor's degree, he went on to Yale University, and there he got his uh, master's degree in state and there and I think that he works now in Yale University. Uh, I saw him a couple of times after, after that. And so, uh, so this is the story. So it is typical in that uh, the school was designed, uh, it was one of its aims to for uh, young people who don't have access, direct access to big universities. So the school had to, the aim was to find them and to give them an opportunity to develop their abilities, their talent, and then move on to this big university. But uh, a non-typical uh, side of his story is that of course, we don't have many people who come, you know, of his faith come from Azerbaijan. So this is, Usually, most of our students just live in Russia and uh, come to our school from Russia. I will talk about it later. And uh, another not very typical thing is that he ended up uh, in a famous international university, American university, whatever. Some of our students do, but uh, not many of them. Mostly they go, especially nowadays, they go abroad outside Russia, I mean, when they are, have already shown the, when they are postgraduates, maybe or even doctorate degrees, something like at this level. Okay, so after this story, I, uh, I will, I want to repeat the main idea and ideas of the school. So uh, one of the objects is, as I have seen, as I have said, that it was it had to um, uh, the school was supposed to give an opportunity to receive a quality mathematical and science education for students from uh, you know from countryside from small towns that don't have access to big to big universities uh, and um, of course at that time it was 1963 and at that time, uh, uh, the country was quickly developing, and uh, there was a big need to engineers, scientists, uh, you know, some some part of this need not not negligible was uh, uh, created by uh, the military complex, of course, and uh, so. In fact, there were there were four schools like mine that opened at that time in the different parts of Russia. One school in Moscow, one in Siberia, Novosibirsk, very similar. It was even a couple of months earlier than than our. Uh, one school in Saint Petersburg, then Leningrad, and one school in Ukraine, Kiev. And a couple of years later, schools in uh, some other republics were also open. Um, similar schools. And um, of course, uh, one more reason for, to have such a school was to have a permanent flow of talents to the university because the schools prepared uh, students to go to this university. Uh, uh, so I have already said some of some of the things that are in this slide. It is um, the date, December 93, when uh, 1963, when um, the school was open and we celebrate the birthday of the school every December, uh, every first Saturday of December. Actually, it was December 2. Uh, <clears throat> But then I also mentioned uh, similar schools in other cities, but and republics. But also I have to mention 
the founder of the school. And uh, actually there were, there was a group of uh, scientists, prominent scientists who played important role, but maybe the most important was played by Kolmogorov, by the physicist Isaac Kikoyan, uh, who is maybe, I don't know if he's famous, in, he's more like experimental, but he was, uh, as far as I know, number three in the Soviet atomic project. So he was not very well known abroad, especially at that time. Not a secret physicist, but uh, not very not very well known. And uh, a very important role was played by the rector of the university, Ivan Petrovsky. He is a, was a mathematician, and of course he played a very important role in establishing the school. Uh, it is interesting that Tomagorov and Petrovsky uh, personally interviewed first students of the school. Uh, so they were really excited by the idea and uh, enthusiastic about this. So here are the pictures of this. This is Kromagorov, this is Tikoyan in the middle, and Petrovsky, the rector of the university, at the right. And this is how the school looked when it was open. So you see there is nothing around. It was a distant part of Moscow, actually almost outskirts of Moscow. And um, so just a field covered with snow in December. Now it totally different. It's all, all surrounded by big high buildings and so on. So it, now it's almost the center of Moscow. And I will, so, and it has gone through some changes. This is, uh, this picture was taken maybe about 2005, and, but it is from, from the other side of the building. Uh, the first photo was from that side. So we have an, or we had an orchard here, apple orchard, and a lot of trees, so very beautiful place, very beautiful area. But now we have a renovation. There, there are new, after many years, uh, we were promised uh, that we will be given a new building. Now we have this building being constructed, and uh, maybe after the new year, somewhere in January, maybe we will move. So now the school has moved to another place temporarily, but then in winter it is supposed to return to the old building and with new buildings. So this is just a picture of the very first um, class of the school. It, it had only 18 students, and uh, maybe here uh, 17, I don't know. It's, uh, I think somebody is missing here. And um, uh, I, I just want to mention that uh, who taught uh, the students. So this is Vladimir Arnold, one of the greatest mathematicians uh, of the, the last century and beginning of this century, very famous one. He, then he, he taught uh, the students at that time. This is a very famous linguist, Sadiznyak. And this is uh, the author uh, this woman uh, is the author of uh, a thick Russian English dictionary. So also a professor of the university. And in the middle, you see Kolmogorov himself. And well, so on. So I could say a few words about students too, but uh, better let's go on. And this is one famous picture of Kolmogorov and students uh, taken later. Okay, so. Uh, after 25 years, in 1988, uh, the structure of the school has changed. So initially it was a kind of an independent school, which had two uh, organizations above. One was university, the other was the Moscow Education Department. So we were between two chairs. And in some way, it was even better because uh, we were at the, we were more more free. Uh, we didn't have only one uh, host, so only one master. So for the school, it was not so bad. Um, but in 1988, uh, the, st the status of the school was changed, and it became 
kind of a department of the university, like uh, there was a mathematics department, physics department, biology department, so on. So the school was a separate, became a separate department of the university. And so uh, you see this line at the bottom, so it is, uh, it explains in a few words how it works now. So for the teachers, it is a university. So all our teachers have university positions like professor and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but for students, it's a school. So it is kind of a dual nature of the school. Uh, so another change, um, so of course, it, of course it is an important change in how all the things were organized in the school. And uh, another change, one of the changes maybe, is that uh, the school expanded uh, its specialization. So originally it was just for mathematics and physics and uh, football. Uh, but uh, in 1988, we had a new um, division. So a class specializing in, in informatics, computer science, and also classes specializing in uh, biology and chemistry. And this just uh, a few years ago, we had a, uh, one class uh, has turned to be an engineering class. And from this year, just this year, we have three, three divisions, science, math, or physics, math, maybe better to say, science, like biology, chemistry, ecology, and uh, research and engineering, something like this. Um, so now I will say a few words about the structure of the school uh, viewed from different perspectives. So we will start from a student perspective. Uh, there are um, uh, 320, 350 students at the school at the same time. It's not very big, and you saw the building is not big. Um, it will grow, I think, after we have this new building, after it uh, comes into operation. Uh, but now this is the number of students we have, and um, we have only two years, uh, 10 and 11. These are the two last years for Russian schools, because in Russia we have 11-year system of education. <clears throat> not 12, like in many other countries. Um, uh, and also we have uh, a couple of classes that come for only one year, only 11th grade. And this was from the very beginning. In the, in the first years, maybe there were three such classes, one year classes. And this year we've had only one. Uh, it depends on the results of the examination. If there are many students who are going to study for one year and they are more bright than those who are going to study two years, then we have more classes in a one year division. <clears throat> so, um, so, and uh, currently, actually every class in our school has a specialization. So there is one mathematics class, well, actually two, one tenth and one uh, grade 10, one grade 11. So two mathematics classes, two physics, similarly, two informatics, two chemistry, two biology, two ecology, two engineering. But the one year they are mixed. So now the faculty perspective. So our we're supposed to have, maybe we do, uh, one teacher per four students. Uh, the classes are um, like, well, 25 students on the average, but we have some classes are 15 students, some classes are 30 students, it depends. Uh, and we have departments for every subject. Uh, it's like university departments, uh, mathematics, physics, well, this is the list. Um, after school department is a department that is, um, responsible for uh, the life uh, for, of the students after classes. So like uh, their dormitory, 
their cultural life, expressions, and so on, all these kind of things. Uh, recession technologies, uh, well, I think it's. Um, uh, then, um, having in view their possibility of creating a similar school in Brazil, I would like to say a few words about the teacher, what kind of teachers we used to have and we have now. So um, in the beginning, only a few teachers uh, of the main subjects were like professional teachers. For example, uh, in mathematics, we had uh, the, the greater parts of the curriculum was uh, um, like some kind of higher mathematics, a little bit higher than the school. But because students had to pass exams to enter university, they had a special class, one lesson a week. It was called elementary mathematics. And there they were taught uh, how to solve problems proposed at this entrance exams, which were uh, at that time actually were very difficult, especially at the in, uh, places like mathematics department of Moscow State or the uh, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology that uh, the guy whom I mentioned in the beginning was studying. Um, so we had two teachers, uh, kind of, they were older, more or less older than the rest, uh, and they taught this elementary mathematics. Very, very good teachers, actually. They were just good teachers. And um, in physics, maybe a little bit similar. Similar. Uh, other teachers, uh, the, some of them were like professors or associate professors, and they gave lectures. But in mathematics, most of them were postgraduate students, and some of them were even undergraduate students. I myself started to teach at this school when I was a student of the, my th third year. So after two years, so I, I actually I graduated from this school uh, myself. Then I two years in the university and still working, uh, studying in the university. As I came sort of came back and started to teach. Yeah, at the school. And um, so now this is the, here you see the, um, our staff, uh, faculty, so 10 professors, uh, 21 uh, associate professors and so on. So uh, 11, well in Russia, the Russian system of uh, science degrees has two degrees, one is candidate it's, and one the higher one is doctor and PhD is maybe something between candidate and doctor maybe closer to candidate something like that so this is we have uh, now um, a lecturer in my school must necessarily be at least a candidate for science so even if it is a literature or history anyway any lecture. of course biology so but it is very important to have young um, teachers. So what happens, what happens, and what this happens in other schools like this, when somebody starts to teach and stays in this school, this, this person grows old, like me, for example, uh, year by year. And so, uh, and this happens to all uh, the permanent um, teachers or tenure teachers, I can say so. so um, so, uh, but it is important to have young teachers because it is important for our students to have a better communication and so on. So I think that it is understandable. And so we always take care of uh, um, inviting this young, uh, young uh, students, uh, postgraduate students back to school. And um, they come, maybe they stay for several years teaching Five years, some of them stay uh, on a permanent basis, uh, but uh, this is uh, this is an important part. And uh, 
also uh, it is very good when we have our own graduates who come back and start to teach because they know the tradition and know, know how, how they were taught and they can continue this. This is also what we take care of. Uh, so the instruction system in the school is uh, quite traditional, traditional for the university. Uh, many innovations have been introduced since then in other places, but we are traditional in this way. So we have lectures and seminars. A lecture is given to a number, several classes at the same time in a big classroom. And uh, originally a lecturer gave lectures to four classes or even five at the same time. Now there are two or three classes at the same time. And then uh, seminar, uh, in the seminar, mostly what we do is in math. Well, of course, I know better what happens in mathematics, but a little what happens in physics too. So in physics, they also do this. I, I mean, they solve problems in mathematics and physics. This, in physics, this is what we do during our seminar. And um, at uh, seminar, uh, we have several teachers at the same time in a class. For example, in mathematics class, in, in mathematics, we have three teachers at the same time. And these teachers ha can talk to students individually. This is why we have several teachers. But in physics, they also have several teachers. They, have, they don't have three, they have two. But what they do, they just divide the class into two groups and work separately. Also in English, they divide the class often into, into three groups like this. Um, so, and I have to mention because uh, this is more, should be about this, more about physics maybe. So uh, I know that in physics, they have introduced maybe a few years ago, a new system when, um, so the schedule, the timetable is done so that, uh, for example, lecture in physics, uh, as I said, it, it is given to two classes and to two classes and to, to other two or three other classes, it is given at the same time, same for seminars. So students are allowed to change, to choose teachers, to choose lecturers. So for example, one semester, they are uh, attending lectures of one professor, but if they don't like, or if they heard that the other one is better, they can move to the other one uh, next semester. And same for, I think, same for seminars. So it doesn't work like this. I mean, uh, th th this is possible in uh, physics because um, um, in physics, they have more or less uniform program. So they teach the same things at the same time. Of course, they teach them differently, but uh, the program itself is the same. But in mathematics, there are big differences between different courses. Even if it is geometry, one geometry professor can teach one thing and the other one will teach something different. Um, so this is the curriculum. Uh, I think we have 37 hours a week, maybe 36. Uh, but, well, I counted it was 37, but it had to be 36, I guess. I don't know where, how, how do, do they squeeze in an extra hour. In the past, we had more. We had like 40, 41, but now there is, a, I mean, the law. To, you are not allowed to have more than 36 or 37 hours. So in mathematics, for example, it is we have three mathematical subjects, main sub main mathematical subject, calculus, subject, and geometry. Each subject is three hours a week. One hour is a lecture, and two hours are seminar. Also, we have a very special subject called mathematical practicum, which is one hour for all classes, but for mathematical classes, it is two hours, and there they do some practical work like. Uh, they have to compute something or to draw some graphs or to draw some, I don't know, three-dimensional figures. Or in the past, they, they used to make big models, 3D models of complicated polyhedra and so on. This uh, subject was introduced 
by Komogorov himself, and he considered it very important. So it continues now, it is uh, in a uh, great part, it is uh, transferred to computer, uh, sort of computer task. So students do a lot of things, like practical things using computers. Uh, so I'm in physics, uh, it's two hours of lectures every week, four hours seminar and two hours of lab work. For lab work, uh, they used to have a big lab in the school, but uh, lately and this year and like five years, they are using the laboratory of the university department. So they do the same tasks, some of, of those tasks that students of the university go. Uh, and so you, this I have told you that um, in, mathem in mathematics, all our teachers are uh, lecturers, at least uh, there is, uh, each of them uh, is very special and gives uh, their own course. So of course they have some general framework for the courses, but details can be very different. And of course we have special courses for elective courses and so on. Now about the selection. Uh, so this is the map of Russia years ago, and uh, its regions are colored according to the number of students who come from this region. For example, here from the far east, is Kamchatka, uh, or this area, which is borders on Korea. Uh, you see red is only one student comes. Uh, but uh, this green part, it's uh, area, it's around Moscow, of course, this is, most students come from this area nowadays. <clears throat> also, we have students, well, you see, I, I'm not going to, this is um, not so important, but I have to say that uh, when the school was created, it was not like this. The country was divided into four areas, and this line, this um, shows the division, it goes along Ural Mountains. So everything to the west goes to Moscow, everything to the uh, east goes to Novosibirsk. <coughs> and students, uh, except this white area here, it is <coughs> a neighborhood of St. Petersburg, and they, those who live here had to go to St. Petersburg school, and uh, Ukrainians, of course, went to Kiev. So this is how it worked before the reform, but now there are no strict borders and anybody can go anywhere in the school. Uh, so how about entrance, entrance exams? So again, in, I have to say a word about the past and the present. In the past, we had three stages of this of selection process. The first stage was the written entrance exam. So um, we sent our representatives who could be not necessarily our teachers, but uh, maybe some postgraduate students from the university or some somebody, I don't know, some instructors from the university, whoever. But of course, most of them were connected to the school. And we sent them to all the different parts of Russia. And uh, when in a certain region, they had their regional Olympiad in mathematics, our people would come there. And uh, one, one of the days, for example, uh, on Wednesday, they write uh, Olympiad. On Thursday, they have exam in mathematics and in physics to the school. This is how it works. And this is how it works now, more or less written exam. Then these uh, papers are taken to Moscow, and Moscow they are checked. And then those who, the winners, so to say, uh, were invited for an oral exam, which was uh, conducted in a similar way, but uh, not, uh, not in every region, but in group, a place for a group of regions, they were united. And so again, we sent our representatives to those uh, places and they uh, interviewed, they had an oral examination with students. And those who passed this examination were invited to summer school 
which used to happen somewhere outside Moscow in a, on a river or in a forest tents and so on. And there they live for um, usually three weeks and they have very intensive studies uh, there, uh, only mathematics and physics. And then they had an examination after that school and that was that was it. Now we don't have oral exam because very expensive. I think it was very expensive. Well, maybe that was the main reason. Uh, and uh, we do have summer school, but it is shorter, and it is conducted in our building, not uh, somewhere outside. And uh, but uh, other than that, it's the same. And uh, why summer school? Why it is important? Because in summer school, we give them uh, material that we, we try to choose as the material that they most of them do not know. They are supposed not to know this material. Sometimes they do. You cannot uh, find something that nobody knows. But, but very few of them would know. And we can see how a student um, acquires this new knowledge, the speed of understanding and so on. So it is more important, not the student, not what the student knows already, not what the student can do already, but how he can, he or she can uh, study and uh, improve. And this can be seen only in uh, direct communication with the students. So, and uh, the examination after the summer school is based on this new material they were given in the school. And of course, we have uh, privileges for uh, higher ranking, highly ranking Olympiad winners. So if anybody is a first prize winner of a National Olympiad, this person is invited to the school without exam. And even if it is not the first prize then, so there is some uh, threshold after which we invite uh, students without exam. Okay, so now um, a few words about some events that we conducted, uh, not only just teaching, not only regular lessons, but also we have uh, uh, like a research conference, international science conference for high school students. It's called Kolmogorov of Readings. This is the announcement of this year's uh, conference. Of course, it was online for the first time and uh, it is international and uh, so we have very good contact with Thailand and with Hong Kong currently with Serbia with some Syria and some countries uh, if anybody would like from Brazil would like to take part we are we'll be happy uh, and it has uh, sections in every subject and students make give talks on their findings and uh, the talks are evaluated by, by the jury, by professors of the university and our teachers who teach in the school or people who do not teach in the school and they are given prizes. So materials are published in a, a proceeding of this country. And this is very interesting, a very interesting event, which is new only, it has happened only three times. It is called Mathematical Modeling Tournament. And uh, well, uh, because I was, uh, I, somehow I became with this, involved in this modeling competitions, mathematical modeling competitions. I um, tried to do something like this in the school and in the country too. And so uh, this uh, tournament consists of four competitions. One is, uh, it's called the uh, math modeling competition. And this is why it is like mammoth, mammoth. It's, uh, so all these animals are uh, abbreviations of Russian names of this competition. So they don't have anything to do with what they do during the competition. So here they are given a, a problem, a real life problem. For example, like, um, uh, okay. Uh, 
the last problem was um, okay how to calibrate uh, uh, you know mushrooms eh? they have this um, they, they they can they understand their position in space so how how they do this so they have special I don't know uh, devices inside special uh, anyway so and uh, students uh, this problem was proposed by Huawei a company and they gave a real data from the calibration process of their smartphones and uh, students have to well, to work to to rework this this data to have some results i'm not going to go into detail don't have time so this lobster competition is about it is actually uh, prob these are problems in mathematics but taken from real life uh, for example one problem was about the shape of a pack with milk uh, i don't know if if you had it any any sometime in brazil but in russia uh, years ago milk was uh, sold in tetrahedrons like triangular pack tetrahedron actually and it was a creation of a swedish invention and uh, what what is the exact shape of this tetrahedron that that was the question and well so uh, this is uh, well, something with computers a little bit like a computer game but with mathematical computer game. and this is uh, one olympiad this is uh, actually it is physics applied mathematics and physics uh, so uh, and uh, this these two com events these two competitions that i mentioned before they are run by our school and in our school but this is the tournament of young physicists which is now an international event and it is run by an international committee and so on maybe you have heard about it but i want to mention that it actually it was born in my school in 1971 and this guy was the one person who invented this competition and he was a teacher of physics then and so at some moment in 19 in 1988 this competition became international and then it developed into an event like a international olympia in physics or in mathematics similar scale um, okay uh, so since we go we'll talk about olympians now i can say a few words about um, the um, results of our teaching uh, or better say some results of our students you see, these are the results in international uh, final rounds of national olympiads this year so we had 10 students in mathematics who were either a winner like in russia we have a winner and then like a prize winner so winners are kind of gold then another prize is, there is no gold still but two two highest degrees and then lower so these two highest we had 10 in mathematics seven in, in informatics informatics our informatics department is very successful in olympiads and so on so you see these numbers many numbers. many students were successful geography uh, got the prize for the first time in our history and these are a few words about international olympiads also not bad so i i did don't give you the whole history of this but this i prepared some time ago years to from 2000, 2010 2015 so these uh, were a number of medals in international olympiads this year we have a gold medal in mathematics in international mathematical olympiads and gold medal in informatics uh, but i must say that uh, i well frankly speaking especially this year or some last year uh, we don't uh, with the school uh, did not play a very big role 
for the students in uh, helping them to win this Olympiad. Because for this very highest um, level of Olympiad, there is a special system of preparation in the country, like a national system, and uh, all year round they are somewhere, they, they maybe only one half of the time of the academic year, or maybe even less, they are actually in the class. Uh, the rest of this time they are spending some, some special schools where they prepare to Olympic and so on. So this is not very good. Actually. Okay, uh, so about our alumni, uh, data by 2018. So it's about 9,000 altogether from the first year to this year. So this is 2000. PhDs, more than 200 doctoral degrees, I said before, two degrees, and uh, academicians, correspondence members. So in Russia, the uh, highest degree for a scientist or a scholar is to become a member, full member of an academy of science. So we have at least five of them, maybe six now, because one was added recently. Uh, and it is interesting that the directors of, uh, I thought that maybe directors of five mathematical institutes, I mean mathematics in high, in uh, broad sense of the academy were our, uh, the directors of the institutes were our graduates. And at least I know definitely the director of Tiklop Institute, mathematical institute, he was in my class. Uh, just one year, by the way, uh, not two years. Uh, uh, the director of the Institute of Computational Mathematics also studied in our school. The director of the National Library. And also, you see, the director of the Swedish Space Institute also is our, he was my student for two years, yes. And uh, the Dean of Mathematics Department of Columbia University is our graduate, but uh, actually, he's my not classmate, but we started in the same year in the school. And so on, so, so you know, writers, doctors, politicians, and so on. So about 60% of the graduates continue their education in the Moscow State University, Lomonosov University, and the others, all the others go to other um, first class, in, in Russia, but Russian first class universities, and some of them continue abroad and so on. So it's uh, but a few. Um, this is our graduation party. It's called the last bell. So. Uh, and a few words about the influence on the national educational system. So uh, you can read it, but to put it shortly, um, Many graduates became the, created their own schools or uh, well schools of different kinds. Not not a real, not an official school, but maybe some um, after class school, something something like this, or summer school or something. So really many. It's, uh, and there. Uh, and uh, the system of boarding schools is uh, approved. And now, just this year, and last year, this year, uh, new schools of this sort are created. Boarding schools for talented students in math and science in different parts of Russia, in, in the South, and uh, in Europe, and so on, so on. So the number of such schools grows and they are given grants by the government to develop. And uh, many universities start their, their schools for, for example, some Moscow university can have a school affiliated with it, but now some of the schools open boarding school, open little dormitories for the students who can come from other places to study there. 
Okay, I think that's it. Now we have a little time for questions. I'm ready to answer. Uh, I don't hear. Thank you, Vladimir. I think we'll now be open to questions from the audience. So, uh, Vladimir, can you say something before the questions arrive? Can yes. you say something about the impact of such a school, the Komogorov school, for instance, yeah. in the educational system in, in the Soviet Union, in Russia? Uh, uh, yes. Um, well, actually, this, this is what I tried to say in my last slide, but uh, actually, uh, well, in the Soviet Union, uh, at, the, at the time when the school was created, we had, uh, there were not only four boarding, the, the number four was four boarding schools. Yes. There were also many, uh, not, not so many, but there were also a few schools that, just normal schools, that were um, oriented, uh, that were specialized in mathematics and physics and uh, uh, they were designed for talented students. So, um, well, first of all, we really, we really give the opportunity to students from distant places to come to Moscow, because I don't know about Brazil, but Russia is a very centralized country. And uh, so sometimes to go from one city to another city, you have to go to Moscow and then to another city and make a, such a roundabout way. But because Moscow is really a country inside the country, it's a, a very special place. And so uh, the best universities are in Moscow, also in St. Petersburg, if, if we talk about mathematics at least, and so on, so on. So, um, so to become successful, in math and science, students had to come to Moscow, especially in the past. And uh, such schools were a very uh, convenient way for them to, to go to, best, to the best university. This is one thing. Another thing is that our graduates, some of them, some of them go to science. Well, nowadays, uh, I, I, I can say that most of them continue as scientists and research mathematicians, but some of them do. Um, but many of them go to education. And so they uh, teach in the universities and they teach in schools. And as I said, uh, I don't know, the, um, the day on, on Saturday, I'm going to the city of Sochi in the south, there will be a all Russian Congress of Teachers of Mathematics. So I invited to give some presentation there. So I saw the list of presenters and I see many graduates, many of them were in my class who are now like um, head of, for example, head of educational department of Moscow School, of Higher School of Economics in Moscow, which is a very popular university now, and uh, and so on and so on. So uh, our graduates, of course, play an important role in continuing uh, the tradition. And uh, uh, I don't think that there are many countries where mathematics and physics, I would say more mathematics than physics is so popular. and where parents think, uh, when, when parents look for a good school for their kids, they would look first at mathematical 
and science schools, you know. So this tradition, this tradition comes from that time. It is not specific for boarding schools, not, but this is how it happened in Russia. It's uh, uh, when I told, told this to my colleagues in other countries, they mostly they were surprised. Because why mathematics? But mathematical school are usually have been usually best in everything, not only in mathematics, but also in humanities and so on. And the they were the best teachers there. Very good. There are questions for you. Uh, um, from one is from Klaus Capelli. He asks the following. He asks three questions. Mm -hmm. Is first one is teaching done only in Russian, or are there classes taught in other languages? Ah, uh, well, regular teaching is done in Russian. What we had, uh, um, we had a kind of a special events when students from a similar school in Korea, I have to say that similar schools were created not only in Russia, but also they have in Korea, they have, uh, they used to have one such school in, in Busan, but I think now they have two or three such body boarding schools in math and science. Um, in Thailand, they have two schools like this. And so this Korean, the students from this Korean school used to come to our school in summer and uh, we organized special classes for them in English. But normally we do, don't do this. We have some, I mean, sometimes we have some exchange programs, but not on a regular level. No. Okay. okay. Second uh, question is the following. How many of the incoming students do graduate programs successfully? What he means is, what is, the, what is your do dropout rate? Ah, dropout rate. Okay, good. Good question. So, uh, you know that normally, uh, I don't know about Brazil again, I know about Russia. Uh, it is very difficult for a school to expel a student. School can only the most they can do is to leave a student for a, to pass the same class for the second time. So he or she can pass 10th grade twice, or maybe three times is too rare, but twice is possible. But our school has a privilege to expel students. So yeah, we, we don't, well, we don't do it often, no. It's, uh, but we have a, uh, well, we have a rule in our, status that the student that uh, doesn't pass three exam in doesn't pass three exams in one session in the main our main subjects like uh, three mathematical subjects physics so if in these four subjects he gets three unsatisfactory grades this student has to be expelled sometimes uh, well the student tries to stay and so on. Sometimes it happens, sometimes not. But so about the rate, maybe um, maybe each session it's well the first. So after the first semester, maybe like five students can be sent home. Uh, many of them are go home. Them, I mean, not many, but. Some of them would go home themselves. They see that this is not, it is difficult for them. So they would better go home and have good marks there and so on. So this is how it works. But uh, sometimes uh, my class can start with 27 students in the beginning and end up with 22. But it doesn't matter that we have, you know, sent out all of them, but some of them would go maybe well, would go by themselves somewhere. It's a very low dropout. Yeah, so his, yeah. His final question has to do with the fact uh, to ask if the students have to pay any tuition. Is it uh, ah. school for free? How is it works? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I can answer. And so, um, from the very beginning, from the Soviet time, the teaching is free. Mm -hmm. But since this is a boarding school, they are supposed to pay for you know 
boarding for in in the past we were even i myself was, was given some clothes some uniform and so on so parents had to pay for this not very much but they had to and the same is now but if a student uh, gives a, so the parents can give a certificate of whatever a document that shows that the family is not very well uh, in the sense of the money and so healthy yeah so they can be yeah, 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 they can be freed from any tuition also we have some sponsors that some can sometimes they can give a stipend but this this is not something regular no so the payment is not very high compared to some private schools no it's uh, and then, and, and, and as I said, if, she, if parents cannot pay, they do not, they are not paying. Okay. Very good. Uh, are there more questions? Uh, the questions can be asked in Portuguese and then I can translate them. Okay, I guess uh, there are no more questions. So again, let me thank you, Vladimir, for your very nice talk. We look forward to, to bring you to Brazil when this problem with COVID is over <laughs> and to have more direct contact with you. <laughs> the closest I've been to Brazil was Mexico. It's far enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. count. <laughs> so you should, you should come. Yeah, definitely yeah. so thank you very much and i thank you everybody for listening to vladimir's talk all the best thank you very much bye